Okay, shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this platform that you have given unto us that uh, we may share your word. Lord, you know we are so insufficient when we are left alone that uh, we may try to weave in anecdotes which are not acceptable in thy sight. And so I pray that you may hold my lips and uh, you may control it, that uh, I may only be able to speak that which is pleasing into thy sight. Father, let your grace be sufficient unto me, that I may be hidden, that Christ may be seen alone, and that we share and learn of these things. May they be practical unto our life, that it may not just be information, but uh, it may be an education, not a condemnation, but a blessing unto us in the precious name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so uh, I'm thankful that uh, God has uh, made it possible that we may be able to again to share in uh, his word. I apologize on Friday that it couldn't be possible because I went to minister uh, in the region so far, uh, Uganda borders. But uh, all the same, without much apologies, I want us to go to the word of God because there is a lot of information that uh, we have to cover and uh, I'd like us to reach somewhere today. Uh, in the last uh, two presentations, we have looked at um, uh, the two steps of the three steps on uh, Jewish wedding model, the ancient Hebrew uh, Jewish wedding model, and that is uh, we saw that there are three parts and we have what we call the Shiduhim and uh, we have what we call the Erusin and then we have Nusuin and that is what we are going to look at. We, we found that uh, the three steps also coincides with the three apartments of the sanctuary. That is uh, the Shiduhim being the matchmaking period where there's friendship, there's interaction to try and uh, Pray about and see if God is bringing you together. And then the second part is the erosine where actually there is uh, the actual courtship and uh, the engagement where actually you have to go to the parents of uh, uh, the both sides to be able to ask a hand in it. And then uh, um, you can agree. And if you are given the lady, then uh, you have to pay the dowry. And then we have the betrothal period of 12 months, whereby you don't see each other, but there is uh, the man from, or the people from the two sides, which will be giving reports to the other side and to the other side. And during this engagement, when you had given your dowry and you are in the 12 months of betrothal, if anything happened, as Joseph and Mary were in such a stage, if you wanted to leave the other person, then you had to write um, a letter of divorcement because during the engagement period, when you paid the dowry, you, uh, uh, you were handed a ketuba, a writing that showed that now this is your wife, although you are not living with that person, you are living with that person. I, I don't want to forget the last question that Angie asked that, uh, how does God make these people one? How are they united? And uh, I want just to make it brief like this. We went through Malachi chapter two, but um, back in the book of Genesis chapter two, um, God said that it's not good for a man to be alone. And so I'll make him a help meet. Uh, and uh, I wish we could talk about this issue of a help meet because uh, people don't, don't understand what it means to be a husband or a wife. Sometimes we think that, um, we can turn our husbands to houseboys or turn our wives to housemates. That is not what God is calling us unto. And um, there is a quotation where E.G. White condemns um, just a person, a man sitting by and letting the wife work. I'll try to get uh, down to this um, uh, quickly if um, I can get it. Uh, um, you give me some seconds, that um, when we marry, 
it's not like uh, we have now uh, come to have a house made in a house working for free or a, 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 a houseboy working for us. And so she condemns uh, the issue of uh, a woman working and the husband just sitting. Mm. And so I, I was saying that, um, how, how, do, how do these people become one? In the beginning, God made um, Adam to have a deep sleep and then he took the rib out of a man and then uh, created for both uh, create, uh, created uh, Eve and then uh, you find that uh, this was flesh of flesh bone of bone but uh, God is not doing that today God is not doing that today uh, we saw in Malachi that he is taking the residue of the spirit in that he takes the spirit of the man and the spirit of uh, the woman. That is something mysterious and he makes them one. And so in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says that the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the believing wife or the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the believing husband so that uh, uh, God, in Malachi chapter 2, he says that uh, he wants to reproduce a holy seed. Uh, and so he says that if it were not so, then your children will be unclean. But now they are clean because the Lord takes off the spirit of the one who is a believer in that marriage and sanctifies the children in the womb. That is a mystery I, I can't explain, but it's do the doing of um, uh, the Lord is the doing of the Lord. And so um, th that is the part that um, we, we, were, we, we left with. And that was the question that uh, I think Sister Angie was asking, how are these made one? It is in a mysterious way that the Lord actually combined the spirit. And um, uh, just uh, uh, to say something that... Uh, when a man and a woman come together, they share hormones, which actually, uh, uh, um, by their interaction, there are hormones which are secreted because of that interaction, which makes them. The, the woman responds in a certain way to this man when they have lived together, and the man responds to this woman in a certain way. And this is uh, some chemical composition, a reaction from the body. And so they, they tend like... Uh, a remote and a TV which is of the same model. When uh, you know you cannot operate a TV with a foreign remote, and so uh, when these two people come together, there's a chemistry that uh, really makes them react as they live together, and uh, this is one of the part of making them one, and also the sharing of the seed. That is the seed of the man. I, I believe the man is the one who has the seed and um, uh, the woman has the over. And so during this interaction and intercourses, actually, there's a way the Lord links them together. And um, uh, it is something that uh, we can explore in uh, anatomy and physiology, how they are um, made one. And so that is where we reach the other time. And uh, I want to try to go into the presentation of today. Uh, yeah, I want to go to the presentation of today, which is the third part of um, the ancient Hebrew uh, wedding model, ancient Hebrew wedding model. And uh, this is the Nisuin, the Nisuin. And so allow me just to go to this straight away. Now, the Nusuin was uh, the third, and uh, can I say the last step in marriage, uh, in, uh, in, in this, uh, the whole process of, of uh, friendship, courtship, and marriage. This is the last step in this uh, uh, Jewish wedding model. And uh, the Nusuin, 
the word nisin means to take, coming from the root word naso, which means to lift up. And then not only will the groom come to take his bride, he will honor her and lift her up. And we find that um, in the courtyard, there is the matchmaking, that is the shiduhin. In the holy place, there is the what we call the erusin, that is uh, becoming, uh, uh, studying each other and what impresses each other and the principles of what will be practiced in marriage. And then you move into the holy place where the marriage place takes place after everything have con been consummated. And um, uh, this is where actually the husband after the 12 months is handed the wife or the woman to, to live with. And so not only will the groom come to take his bride, he would honor her and lift her up. And you find that this is the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, the first coming is to ask for, to get involved in a, a relationship and a courtship with the, the woman. And then after that, he goes back, the bridegroom goes back to the father and there is the communication that is there. And there is the person who is passing the information between the bridegroom and the groom or the husband and the wife. And we see that it is um, the Holy Spirit, the representative of Jesus Christ that now speaks to the church as Christ went back to the Father. Christ does not come to us. He sends his representative, the Holy Spirit, and there is the back and forth between humanity and uh, heaven through the Holy Spirit. And so we shall see Christ the second time when he comes to take the bride and lift her up. And to lift her up is to take her from where she was to another place. And so um, uh, the same way that uh, Christ would come to take the church and then go to the father's place, that is what happened in the third step of the ancient Hebrew wedding model. After 12 months, the man came to the uh, place uh, of the woman and took her. And where did he take her to the to his father's house? And then they lived there for a period. And uh, in some other cultures, like in our culture, it is like you live in your father's house for one year. As um, as your wife uh, uh, gets to interact with the new mother or uh, the mother-in-law and be able to know what this man likes and all that stuff and uh, be able to be educated somehow uh, the things of that community and so on for one year because before they are released to live in their own home. So we find that Christ will come and take his church to heaven and then they'll be there in the father's house for a thousand years. That is uh, the sweetest and the longest honeymoon that will ever take place. And uh, this is what I tell people that uh, have never attended the honeymoon. Don't cause chaos, be consoled because there is coming a honeymoon where you'll be there for a thousand years. So you don't need to cause problems in your home that uh, I never had a honeymoon. And so uh, there is a grand honeymoon coming and uh, we shall all partake in. Oh, someone is in Facebook is questioning that you address the issue of marrying an unbeliever. Perhaps you can give a highlight in the end. Thank you so much. I'll touch on that. Just uh, remind me when I'm ending. I'll be able to revisit uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and Deuteronomy chapter 12. And so in this, Nusuin, not only will the groom come to take his bride, he will honor her and lift her up. And then um, that is what is going to happen in the second coming. When the groom came for his bride, there was a great possession of joy, jubilation, and shofar blast. We shall be looking at Matthew chapter 25, the 10 virgins, five wise and five foolish when we reach in the story of the wilderness. Uh, it, it will be something interesting, although it is um, uh, attached to the second coming where those who are ready go in and those who are not ready are cast out, but I'll deal with it when I'm dealing with the, the sanctuary in the, in, the, in the wilderness where people are left in darkness, people who didn't cherish light, they are left in darkness for a thousand years and um, uh, uh, they will have no other chance of attending the wedding ceremony, but uh, a fearful condemnation. And so uh, let us 
go back to the marriage issue, when the groom came from his, for his bride, there was a great possession of joy, jubilation, and chauffeur blast. The bride will see the light of the procession in the night and have to go out and meet the groom as he came for her, as he came uh, for her. And so um, the bride will see the light of the procession in the night and have to go out and meet the groom as he came for her. Then um, she will light her oil lamp and go out and meet the groom. This is the language of Matthew chapter 25. And so when uh, Christ is giving the story of Matthew chapter 25, he is looking at the Jewish, the ancient Hebrew Jewish wedding model. And uh, for the people whom he was speaking to, they understood the language concisely, what actually it meant. And uh, this issue of marriage was not a simple thing because um, there were at times when actually the, 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 the lady will not be ready to get married. And uh, this, this was a serious thing, which um, we have to consider too. Although the bride knew to expect, although the bride knew to expect her groom after about a year, she did not know the exact day or hour of his coming. The date was not given, but they were actually promised that he would come. And so she wanted to be looking forward because this was an exemplary event that was going to happen to test if this lady was ready for this man. And uh, it seems like uh, the day cometh as a thief uh, as per the second coming of Jesus Christ. It was the father of the groom who gave final approval for him to return to collect his bride. And so the father uh, of the lady, uh, the father of the, 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 the husband to be is the one who gave the debt. Uh, after he had prepared everything well to host the daughter-in-law and prepared the room for where his son and the daughter-in-law will be able to live for this period of the honeymoon or uh, the period of knowing each other as a husband and wife, then he gave the date and it was unexpected because it was given like this and then the, the man went to take um, the wife. And uh, we find that... Uh, in the Bible, that uh, it is the father who will give the day and the hour of uh, the son's coming to take um, the church to heaven. For that reason, the bride kept her oil lamps ready at all times as the groom usually came in the night. The groom will then take his bride and take her back to his father's house to consummate and celebrate. And this, this, uh, this, this the process of consummation was the most. Uh, uh, I can say the most uh, excellent period or the most uh, intense, intense uh, session because you find we shall be reading some uh, uh, spectacular things. The couple will finalize their vows and bring a cup of wine to signify their union. Now, you remember when Jesus said that I'll not drink of this cup again until in my father's kingdom. And so they were not to share any meal. That is the bride and the bridegroom, between this period of betrothal, there was no meal that was to be shared between the two. They would wait until that period of consummation when they will take the meal again. And the father promised that I'll not take of this vine again until in the kingdom. And so we find how the Jewish wedding model was really intrinsically tied with um, the, the redemption plan. And so what happened in the consummation? The consummation followed a procedure as well. And what is to consummate? To consummate is to, uh, 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 um, let me say, to eat it up or uh, to take it up or to, to finish, up, uh, to fi something like to finish. So the consummation followed a procedure as well. The bride might have up to 10 friends who would act as witness to the event. The mother of the bride and or the bride herself will sue the name of the couple on a cloth. This was called the proof of virginity that the bride will bleed 
onto a CLA on top of it during copulation. And so this was to test if uh, the bride had involved herself in extramarital activities uh, uh, before she was married. And if there was not that blood during the copulation, then it was proven that the lady was not a virgin and that this was a very embarrassing moment in the consummation of the marriage. And uh, just reading, reading on, this is where the parable of the 10 virgins come in. The bride's 10 virgins served as a witness and will walk with the bride in a ceremony to the wedding feast in the house of the groom. As the bride was waiting for the groom to arrive and take her to his father's house, the 10 fell asleep due to the unexpected delay of the groom. Once the groom arrived, the male witnesses of the groom would announce his arrival with a chauffeur and calls from his voice to the bride and her maidens. At this point, they trimmed their lamps, which um, had been burning, and the wife's virgins had extra oil needed because of the delay. Continued on, as the groom takes the bride to the super room or uh, the consummation room, a celebration party begins in the outside room, and the five foolish virgins run to buy extra oil. The entire wedding party make their way to the groom's house and the door is closed when the last person in the procession enters. The five foolish virgins arrive and knock on the closed door and are told, I never knew you and are forbidden to end um, the wedding uh, feast. And so the shupa used in the betrothal ceremony was used as a covering for the wedding bed. Once the marriage was consummated, the groom would hand the proof of virginity to the witness and the celebration would begin. Suppose that this was not the case, then there was no wedding. There's no consummation of the marriage. And then it will be that uh, the lady will return the dowry that uh, had been given because he had proved herself unfaithful. Because during the engagement day when the dower was being paid, it was assured the groom that uh, the bride was a virgin. And so if on the day of consummation, it was not proved so, then it was a big embarrassment and uh, there was no wedding on that day. And then... Uh, uh, I have read some places where actually uh, another lady who was a virgin was taken by the man who had came to the wedding, uh, but uh, I have not seen that in the wedding. Um, only something that comes close to that is when Samson went to take um, uh, to, to take the lady, and then they uh, he tried to pose a riddle, and then um, they urged. Am I getting the thing correct? I think um, he never took that. The, the first lady before, uh, I think the Lila. Uh, what he did, he went away. He never took the lady. And then the man, the best man he had with took the lady. And then um, uh, things uh, were like that. And so uh, there has been stories that if the lady was not found to be a virgin, one of the virgins in that group was taken and given to this man. And so it, it, it was something which is embarrassing. It's like Christ just finding us unready. It, it is something which is embarrassing and um, it will seal our fate eternally. Great importance was put upon the virginity of the bride. And that is why you find in Revelation chapter 14, verse 5, he says that, um, I'll just go there quickly, the book of uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 5. Revelation 14, verse 5. Um, this is uh, what we read. And uh, verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whatsoever he goeth. These are redeemed. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruit unto God, unto the Lamb. 
the, the, the language of the marriage uh, sounded like the language of um, the redemption plan. And so great importance was put upon the virginity of the bride. The witnesses were there for the specific job of confirming the bride's virginity. And so uh, this is not like unto Christ in specifics exactly because there is uh, an investigation going on as we are and Christ is not coming to try out if the church is a virgin or not. He's coming to take a church which is complete. But because uh, there is limitations in the shadows, that is why actually in the consummation day, that is when it was tested if uh, the lady was a virgin or not and uh, there was a plot for that. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 13, when any man takes a wife and shall go in her and shall hate her and shall make abusive charges against her and bring an evil name on her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I did not find her a maiden. Then the father and mother of the young, of the young woman will take and bring out the proof of the girl's maidenhood to the elders of the city at the gate. And the girl's father shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man a wife and he hates her. Verse 17, and see, he has made abusive charges against her, saying, I did not find your daughter maiden, and yet these are the proofs of my daughter's maidenhood, and they shall spread the garment before the elders of the city, and the elders of that city shall take that man and punish him, and find him 100 pieces of silver and give them to the father of the young woman, because he has brought an evil name on a maiden of Israel or Israel, and she is to be his wife, He's not allowed to put her, her away all his days. If you took a virgin girl, you were not allowed to put her away because you had ruined, it's like you had ruined her life and chunk of, um, uh, 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 of being the mother of Jesus. And so if you take her and you start mistreating her and you start uh, railing accusations against her, the proof that was uh, 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 given on the consummation day will be laid before the elders and then the man will be fine. I tell you, this kind of system in marriage helped a lot in uh, being able to keep the families intact, although later in the later period, in the latter period, the Jewish people started lost sight of uh, the peculiarity that the marriage vow had and started putting their wives away on easy things. But um, if you read Matthew chapter 19, Jesus says it was not so from the beginning, which means that things were not so until at a certain period when they changed. When sin multiplied, the love of many grew um, uh, uh, cold and so uh, they did everything uh, ev anything that they wanted, although it was not so from the beginning. Today, we joke around, you take uh, somebody's daughter and you start abusing her, you start misusing her and just saying anything you want. Rem remember, this is uh, the daughter of a king and um, the way she should be treated, it is not so much of the father on earth, but the father in heaven who is seeing you and what you are doing. And that is why he say in Malachi chapter two, and uh, now it's a time to go there again in the book of Malachi, chapter 2. Malachi, chapter 2. And uh, I'll read from uh, verse 14. Yet he say, wherefore, because the Lord hath been a witness between thee and the wife of the youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet it's she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one, yet had the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, said that he hated putting away. For one covereth violent with his garment, saying, The Lord of hosts, therefore take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. And this thing of putting away, this thing of mistreating and uh, putting to a public shame, 
the wife of the youth, God says that it is violence. It is nothing but um, violence that people are uh, practicing in their lives. And so if there was such a thing, um, actually the man was fined for doing such a thing, either abusing the wife or putting away the wife. He was fined. And uh, you find that people came to a point they did not care about it because they were so rich and they could divorce at any time and marry at any time and just pay the fine. Some others would do it and even not pay the fine. And so Israel became an abomination to the nations which were surrounding them because they copied the uh, customs of other nations. And so, but if the matter is true that the girl was not found a maiden, then they shall bring out the girl to the door of the father's house and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones because she has done wickedly in Israel or Israel to who in her father's house. Thus you shall pay the evil from your midst. Can you imagine such a thing that um, a man marries a lady and then it comes out that she was not a virgin in the olden time that she would be stoned to death. You may you may recoil upon such an information, but actually it shows the seriousness of how the church has to keep itself pure because if it is not found pure, it will be destroyed by the seven last plagues. This was the fate of the woman who had not kept herself pure and then she was given in a marriage. And so her fate was to be stoned to death. And um, the church which has professed to Christ, it is calling itself Christians. When the time Christ comes and finds that they are not pure, they will be actually, they will face the seven last plagues as the lady faced uh, the stoning from her unfaithful to the man. And uh, remember that if the bride was found guilty of adultery, she will lose everything and the groom will keep the whole of the bridal in inventory. The bride price was 50 shekels of silver. The cost of accusation of halotu was 100 shekels of silver. And um, uh, I'll just go through this. And um, uh, in, in the money of today, the cost of uh, being found unfaithful was uh, 1,379 euros. I'll just do the conversion uh, um, quickly here. There is uh, 1,379 euros, 1,379 euros into Kenyan shilling. And you will find that um, there is uh, 210,071 uh, uh, shillings. This is um, what you find. If uh, you convert the money today, this is what you will find, Kenyan shillings. So if the lady was found to be, uh, she had lost her virginity and the dowry had been paid, and they promised the man that the lady was a virgin, then she will have to pay 210 Kenyan shillings and 71 shillings. And if the man was found to be guilty of accusing this woman and she was a virgin, then he will pay the equivalent 210 and uh, 71 shillings plus losing the dowry to the lady. Remember that um, half of the dowry was returned to the man. And so, you know, when uh, God was putting these things in place, it was not a joke. I think it is in these days that we are joking with the courtship, engagement, and relationship things. But um, God took it seriously, very, very seriously. And um, um, uh, the total fine of everything was, uh, uh, that is uh, 2,758 euro dollars if you convert 2758 and uh, i'll just try to 2758 2758 euros into kenyan shilling what kind of money will you get for the whole fine that is 420,143 shillings 
that is how expensive being found a sinner in courtship, engagement, and consummation of the marriage was. But uh, I don't know if we should say thank you to the Lord because he has shown us a lot of grace, but uh, okay, no, thank you because uh, sin at the end will be punished. We cover the altar of the Lord with uh, violence. In fact, going back to the book of Malachi chapter two, this is what the Lord says. Um, in uh, verse 13. And this have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regarded not the offering of any more. He regarded not the offering any more, or receiveth it with goodwill at your hand. When we get involved in this thing secretly, and continue hiding people, and we think that God does not see what he says, he doesn't accept our offerings. When we mistreat our husbands and wives, we are covering the altar of God with tears and weeping and with crying out. And so he doesn't receive our offerings and he doesn't receive um, anything from our, our hand with them. Um, a good will. And so we should be careful when we start, we enter into the issue of the marriage because it, it, it's not a joke. It's not a joke that uh, we are entering in. So in the consummation, this is why when the proof of virginity was presented, there was great joy and elation and the celebration could begin. He that has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoice greatly because of the voice of the bridegroom. So this joy of mine is complete. When they had consummated the marriage, that is, and brought out that cloth of virginity and handed to the witnesses, now the celebration uh, started uh, at that point. And uh, we understand that when Christ comes and takes his church, which is pure and without spot, the inhabitants of uh, unfallen world, the angels, and everyone that is saved in the kingdom there will be a great celebration and we are told that we shall be given harps and uh, we shall uh, sing a song of uh, victory. And so knowing all this, let's look at um, uh, some examples of uh, the Jewish wedding model. So we went through Matthew chapter one, but uh, I'll just repeat it speedily as we go through this. But the birth of um, uh, Messiah was as follows. After his mother Miriam was engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be pregnant from the set apart spirit or the eternal spirit. And Yosef, her husband, being righteous and not wishing to make a shoe of her head in mind to put her away secretly. Remember, the fine was Kenya shillings around 420, uh, that is um, 420,143 uh, hundred shillings. And uh, Joseph, looking at the situation, didn't want to put this lady into a public shame or her to be stoned to death. And so he decided to put her away secretly so that um, he may not get into the issue of finding this lady and making her a public show, but uh, decided to put her away secretly. If you put her away secretly, then she was not pursued as the person on the wrong. But while he thought about this, see a messenger of God appeared to him in dreams saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Miriam as your wife for that which is in her was brought forth by the set apart spirit. And she shall give back to a son and you shall call his name um, um, Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin or Jesus. And all this came to be in order to fulfill what was spoken by God through the prophet saying, see a maiden shall conceive and she shall give birth to a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel with which translated means uh, God with us. And Yosef awakening from his sleep did as the messenger of God commanded him and took his wife, but knew her and not until she gave birth to her son, the firstborn, and he called his name Jesus. 
And so this was the situation because he didn't want to bring her into embarrassment and the fines that were involved. And so uh, he took her to be his wife. And so that was the part of uh, uh, the Nisuin and the consummation of the marriage. And uh, it shows the importance of keeping ourselves pure because this is a representation of uh, the plan of redemption. When God gave marriage to men, it was to act as um, uh, a lesson or an object lesson to the redemption plan. And so we find that um, marriage is more spiritual than physical. Marriage was more of something that um, was spiritual than physical. We think that uh, just marriage is coming together and making babies and all that stuff. No, marriage is more spiritual than people ever think. And if we will handle it as spiritual things, then we shall find that um, even our um, spirituality, character-wise, and relationship with the church will be more mature and more concrete than it is today. The reason why actually the churches are full in sin, it is how the marriages are conducted. Because the church has to start at home by that marriage. And uh, after um, it, uh, it is um, proven to be um, perfect, then that perfection can be uh, extended to the church or to the community. And so it, it was a spiritual thing to be involved in uh, marriage. But uh, the way actually marriages are conducted these days, it's a sign of uh, end times. People do not have God in their mind. Everyone wants to do uh, what um, they they want. And so uh, as maybe I just uh, do some conclusion before I go to marrying the unbeliever. Uh, as we wrap up this uh, a presentation on uh, the, the three steps in uh, the ancient uh, Hebrew or Jewish wedding model. The Nusuyin, uh, once the marriage had been consummated, there was a huge celebration that usually lasted for seven days. This celebration usually happened after the harvest when there were plenty of fruit, wine, and general joy. It sounds like the feast of the tabernacle. After the day of atonement and the church, uh, uh, after the second coming of Jesus Christ, then there is uh, the feast of the tabernacles, the feast of ingathering, and then followed by a thousand years uh, of uh, honeymoon. And so this celebration usually happened after the harvest when there was plenty of fruit, wine, and general joy. This celebration happened at the groom's place, which he had prepared at his father's house. And uh, that is the best time to read John chapter 14. This is the best time to read John chapter 14 again. John chapter 14. The Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I will have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may also. And with I go, you know, and the way ye know. And so that is the issue. Christ went to prepare a place for the bride. And after everything has been finalized, the father will tell him, go now, bring your wife so that... Uh, you may dwell here. And so the celebration happened at the groom's place, which he had prepared at his father's house, and that coincides with the John chapter 14. And um, um, we are waiting for that great day that uh, is soon coming before us, the second coming of Jesus Christ to take his church, which has been faithful unto himself, and take it to his father's presence uh, that uh, there they may have uh, the dwelling place, their honeymoon, and then uh, have uh, um, a, a place on this earth, according to Matthew chapter 5, that the meek shall inherit the earth. And so I pray that uh, these uh, issues, we will take uh, a closer look at them again. 
and uh, ask ourselves, how have we conducted ourselves in our relationship? Have we been faithful or have we been unfaithful to our marriage uh, transaction? And uh, as I said before, there is information that uh, maybe some of us have been missing or some have been missing. But then we are told that um, in the days of ignorance, God winged at it. But uh, for those who have not entered into marriage, it is a time that uh, we may look at these things once again. And uh, in every step that we make, we may seek the Lord in prayer so that uh, we may not take a step that uh, will bring a reproach to the name of the Lord or be able to destroy the symbolism of the plan of redemption which were meant to be revealed by the marriage transaction. I was talking about um, uh, the issue. The, it's the issue that was raised that uh, I should uh, speak about the help, the, 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 the help me, help me once again. Uh, I was saying this, and uh, I hope uh, I'll get this uh, quickly, that um, just uh, a moment about the issue of understanding a health need more clearly. Um, And so as I look for this, those who are in courtship, you may start thinking of uh, these things and uh, ask the Lord to help you in prayers. The issue was uh, the issue of um, overworking each other. The, So the, the issue of uh, the help meet, um, when uh, God gave uh, Adam Eve, she, he, he was not to rule over her, but uh, she was to compliment him. And uh, you understand that, um, uh, you understand that um, Adam at least had something that, uh, uh, had uh, to give this uh, wife a comfort. And then uh, she had to compliment him. She had to assist uh, him in, uh, in his uh, work. And also it was meant that um, the man should be able to instruct and uh, entreat. Uh, um, the, the man was to help the, the, the wife and, and treat her in everything rather than forcing her to do anything. And so uh, that is uh, the, the issue of uh, having help meet. But uh, there's a specific quote I'm looking at. Yeah, this is it. This is 5T, page uh, one, uh, 180. Um, so let me try to share it. A woman does herself and her family a serious wrong when she does her work and theirs too. When she brings the wood and water and even takes the ax to prepare the wood, while her husband and son sit about the fire having a social easy time. God never designed that wives and mothers should be slaves to their families. And that is what I was saying that um, when you marry, don't turn your wife into a slave. 
a housemaid. And when uh, you get married, don't turn your husband into a houseboat. In that the labor should be shared so that uh, not any of the two should feel the, um, the, 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 the which word is this? Should feel the burden that it is laid on their shoulders and the other one is not contributing. We should not be consumers in marriage. We should be at least uh, 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 um, uh, providers in the, in the marriage realm. God never designed that wives and mothers should be slaves to their families. Many a mother is overburdened with care while her children are not educated to share their domestic burdens. As the result, she grows old and dies prematurely, leaving her children just when a mother is most needed to guide their inexperienced feet. Who is to blame? Husbands should do all they can to save the wife, care, and keep her spirit cheerful. Never should idleness be fostered or permitted in children, for it soon becomes a habit. When not engaged in useful employment, the faculties either depreciate or become active in an evil work. What you need, my brother, is active exercise. Every feature of your countenance, every faculty of your mind is indicative of this. You do not love hard work nor to earn your bread by the sweat of your brow, but this is God's ordained plan in, a, in the economy of life. You fail to carry through what you undertake. You have not disciplined yourself to regularity. System is everything. Do but one thing at a time. And do that well, finishing it before you begin a second piece of work. And this is where many men and many wives fail. That um, you find men and women, they have a lot of things in their programs in that um, at the time, actually, they are going to sleep, that uh, they sleep so tired or they can manage and regulate their finances well because there is a host of things and you are turning uh, touching this and you are touching that, you are touching this and touching that, in that um, there is nothing accomplished by the end of the day or the at the end of the time. And so you find that uh, life starts becoming so hard because things that should be done are not done because there are no priorities and there are no planning. And so that is why in a marriage, there should be consultations and uh, a coming together because this person is a help me and you are a helpmate too to her, they should be coming together to see if we do this, will it burden the family? If we do this, will the happiness of the other be ruined? This is not a, an issue of a husband and a housewife or a, a wife and a houseboat. These are two helpmates becoming one. These are two people becoming one and being me to each other. And so, uh, if you are going to conduct a marriage in a way that one person will be burdened, that will not be a marriage, but it will be like you're having a house boy or a, 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 a house lady or a, a maid in your home. You should have a regular hour of rising for praying, for eating. Many waste hours of precious time in bed because it gratifies their natural inclination and to do otherwise requires an exertion. Continued on that um, one hour wasted in the morning is lost never to be recovered. Says the wise man, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding and lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles, had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one of the that traveled, and thy want as an armed man. Those who make any pretensions to godliness should adorn the doctrine they profess and not give occasion for the truth to be reviled through their inconsiderate course of action. O oh, no man, anything says the apostle, you ought now, my brother, to take hold honestly to correct your habits of intolerance redeeming the time, let the world see that the truth has wrought a reformation in your life. Uh, one last thing about um, family life and how um, it is such a, an important thing, family life. I'll just put something on the screen too.
Uh, if I find it quickly, I'll put it there. If I don't find it, I'll go to, there is some, um, Uh, Deuteronomy. Yeah, I have found it. And so I like to read this also. This uh important, although it is long, but uh, I'll try just to read some of um no, I, I think this is so much I'll be able to read it in the next session because uh, it's so much. Otherwise, I'll put on the chat group so that uh, people may look at it, but uh I'll be able to present it, the home religion, how important it, it is. And so somebody was asking there as we finish that uh, I touch on uh, the issue of uh, marrying unbelievers. Uh, uh, I don't know if Fred, now you can repeat that very well. Someone in Facebook is requesting that you address the issue of marrying an unbeliever. Perhaps you can give it a highlight in the end. And um, for those who are not married, I'll go straight in the in the word of God, what it says in the book of um, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and see. Just the same way Christ is not coming to take anyone to heaven who is an unbeliever, a person who is entering into marriage should not enter into a marriage with uh, an unbeliever. Deuteronomy chapter 7. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Gigashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, uh, the word of the Lord continues to say, verse 2, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages. This is it. Now, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, or his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Why? For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thou shalt deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break their images and cut down their goods and burn their graven images with fire. Now, can you notice that you shall break down their altars? This is the place of worship. So their worship shall be done away completely. And so if anyone has any altar in her life or in his life, which does not correspond with the word of God, you have no business entering into marriage alliance with that person. I have heard people say that, um, uh, I have heard people say that, um, oh, you know what, you always say that, uh, people always say that you should not marry a Sunday keeper if you are a Seventh-day Adventist or so on, and you should not intermarry in religions. But uh, somebody say, oh, you know, I married a Catholic and I was able to convert her into SDA or something of that kind. I tell you, just because things happen that way, it does not mean that that was the right thing. Maybe you acted in ignorance or God winked at it, or, um, you know, it is because of his great masses that we are not consumed. Others have taken that step and today they have separated or divorced or the families are at loggerheads. And uh, others have done that in ignorance and God extended mercy unto them in that uh, the other party was able to join their religion. But it is something that is condemned in Deuteronomy chapter seven that Anyone who is having a different altar from your altar, you should not enter in marriage alliance with that person. Also in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 12, the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12, we find the same thing. Um, and uh, these are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that you live upon the earth. He shall destroy all the places where in the nations which he shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green 
tree and you shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire and you shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them of that place. You shall not do so unto the Lord your God, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation, you shall ye seek and thither shall come. And then you shall bring your offerings and then um, you shall put the name of the Lord there. And then he says um, that uh, thou shall not give in marriage your daughter or your son. Uh, you can continue exploring the book of um, Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 12. I don't know. Um, yeah. In, in, uh, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, it talks about not marrying your son or your daughter. And in Deuteronomy chapter 12, it talks about destroying their altar. So there is no the intermingling of the religion or putting together two religions to make up a marriage alliance. God forbids that. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, has been answered. What if you find yourself, you find yourself in a, such a marriage and... Uh, this is the time you're finding uh, the information. We are told that uh, in First Corinthians chapter seven, uh, if uh, the husband or the wife is pleased to live with you, there should be no problem. But if they decide to leave, then uh, uh, so be it, let them uh, 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 leave. And a brother or a sister is not bound by such a things. Otherwise, as we shall be going into uh, a marriage being a symbol of the church in the next presentation, we shall be looking that uh, this marriage issue, it is so serious that the church will never prosper when evil or bad marriages are happening. When the marriages are not conducted aright, then we don't have a church completely. And this is the issue that we shall be looking at how that transaction of the marriage when it is done badly, it destroys not only the two people who have decided to come together, but it destroys the church as a whole. And that is what we shall be looking at, at how this transaction was so closely related to the, uh, 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 to the church itself. And so God bless us. And um, I hope that uh, we shall continue learning in the class of Christ. We may not just give everything that is needed to be given, but uh, we shall be gleaning a little here and a little there. And I know at the end of the day that um, whatever has been lacking, God will provide. And uh, wherever we have fallen short of the glory of God, if we come back to him in repentance, he shall be able to supply all our needs in his richness, in his glory. And so the Lord bless us. And uh, shall we close uh, with... Um, a word of prayer. Shall we close this uh, with uh, a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you once again because uh, you want to bring us to a state where we are perfect because you say in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And Lord, those who receive the seal of God have to reflect the image of Christ fully. You are not coming to take our people who are doing permissive will, but the perfect will. And so we pray that uh, your word may bring comfort unto us. We may not see it as a hindrance and as a hedge. And uh, that which restricts us from any liberty. But uh, we may take it as our security, our guard against any kind of apostasy. We know that uh, if any man doeth thy will, he shall understand of the doctrine, as you say in the book of uh, John chapter 7. And so we want to know of thy will and thy doctrine, and that we may get the strength to walk in it. And so, Father, do not deny us this chance of being your children once again. And let uh, the perfection of Jesus Christ be manifested in our lives now and forevermore. And Lord, forgive us our sins and our shortcomings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Amen.